It's a, honestly, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you for making the time for me. I know you are exceptionally busy at the moment. Uh, well, you're busy all the time, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> yeah, the last few years, especially. Uh, well, I would say the last like six years, I've just been flying by. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the things that I wanted to ask you sort of to start the interview before we talk about the accessibility stuff and before we talk about uh, some of the work you've been doing more recently, um, I, I wanted to get your reaction to success and your success and what that definition, what that word means to you, because you've had all the streams, you've had worldwide popularity for your beautiful, beautiful music and you've impacted many people's lives. So first off, how do you define success, Galen? And what does that word and phrase mean to you as a person? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I feel like for me, success is being able to to do what you love and what you set out to do and to reach an audience. But I don't think it's about, for me, I'm creating something that you're proud of, um, but for me, I guess long term, there's no you don't control really what happens after you release something. Like if it's about you know widely received or if it's small or if it changes, you work on you know, how to um, take off or not. So I think that kind of the results is less the issue than if you're working in something you love that you are proud of um, that that gets an audience, no matter how big or small that it is. I think that's important, and for me. Being able to do this for a living has been has felt a lot like success. To be able to to do it um, and really focus all my energy on it that's been really neat. And that's something I was really setting out to do when I started performing. You know that 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 came kind of circuitous route of becoming a professional um, that I wasn't even really expecting. So that's been neat to be able to keep doing stuff um, that way. But I think you can, I mean, I think success is an interesting word because we, I don't, I don't think we should think of music as <laughs> that way. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's more about the activity part of it and the, uh, if it's collaboration or if it's just um, putting your mind to something and creating something that you feel needs to come out. I think that's probably the most important stuff to focus on rather than how it's received in the world. Although, you know, it's been fun to be able to do it for a living, of course. So that's, I'm grateful for that. Yeah, it's Is that a bad answer. That's no, long. Sorry. No, <laughs> no, no, it's a great, it's a great answer. And I mean, I, I, I think you kind of answered my next question a little bit. I wanted to get one more definition, one more kind of uh, almost yeah. word association from you, and that is legacy. Now, uh, again, you have created. At least as a as a as a listener and for, as an outsider to your music, who you know has followed your success, I think you've got quite the legacy. Now, do you concern yourself with with the idea of legacy? Uh, and again, uh, what does that kind of word and phrase mean to you as a musician and as an artist, and I guess as a person as well? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think I think you don't. Maybe this sounds. I'm just sorry, these are good questions, so they're catching me off guard. No, take your time. Um, yeah. um, I think to me, yeah, I think legacy is an interesting concept because I guess I look back at the music I've created and I like to see how it's changed and I hope that it continues to do that, to evolve and like each thing maybe has a different element. You know, like the Macbeth soundtrack is unlike anything I had made before and so like that was really fun, and if, if that's what a legacy is, then I'm all about it, because it's like a catalog, of like a journey that you took with the artist to see where they where they began and then how they ended up learning and, and changing their skill set to, like, evolve. And I think that's a cool legacy. The legacy of, like, your what you're remembered for is funny, because I think most people don't know their legacy. You know, mm. like, I had this one show... It's like not like like I had this one show in Louisville, Kentucky that was poorly advertised. Like the venue didn't even have it on their website until like two days before. It was terrible. But only five people showed up. One of them was so drunk that he fell over in the middle of the show, and like I thought he was dead, but he luckily was not. And then good to know. But another couple had driven three hours 
three hours to come see it because they and they brought their disabled child with them because they wanted them to, so so that is a funny thing to think about legacy because i think that i don't think you know your legacy until it's it's very personal to the person listening i think like um the person who drove three hours clearly like felt compelled to do that and i think it's really nice to know that even if only five people are there, it doesn't mean you have, don't have a leg. Like your legacy is like with the individuals. I think who care about your music. Um, I don't know what my legs will be like on a broader scale because I do believe there are so many barriers to disabled artists. But mm. it is sort of like still, even though I'm grateful. And in the UK, ironically, it seems like easier to get the word out about an artist on an independent scale. Like, I'm an independent artist, but here in the U.S., it's like people know of me because of the YouTube video or they've been to my concerts, but it's such a big place that, mm. like, legacy-wise in terms of press or write-up or whatever, it's limited here because I don't think disability and art are valued. I think even the U.K. is doing a better job, I think, of amplifying disabled artists than the U.S. is, and we're working to change that. That's why I founded that group. Yeah. Right because I think uh, co-founded it. I should say Lachi founded it. I helped her. Um, but I wanted to be a part of that because disabled artists don't have anyone advocating for them in the U.S. doesn't mean that I haven't had success. I mean, that Macbeth thing was so cool, and, and I'm really grateful for I've had some really cool opportunities. But I'm saying, legacy-wise, you would look back and be like, oh, this was a small independent artist. Interesting. Because, but, but I know that my legacy is different i feel my legacy is for all those people that made a point to come yeah. and and got and, and we're excited about it so and i won't ever know the full impact and nobody will like you think about um you know alan sparhawk and they're going through those health challenges right now and you know so many people are reaching out and i think it's like i think it's so cool because they've touched a lot of people it, you don't have to be the biggest band in the world <laughs> to have uh, like an impact in people's lives. I think you can be, I mean, you know, a lot of the artists that I love the most are not one I guess, you know, like there are people I've met on the road who I just think were excellent and I love their songwriting. And so yeah. their legacy is big to me, but maybe not to, you know what I mean? It's not to the mainstream. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes it makes so much sense. And, and I want to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But you mentioned the Macbeth stuff. And and, and before we talk about Ramped, I, I want to ask, you know, about about working on that and, and doing the composition for that and, and having the, the different experience to, say, composing something of your own, you know, Someday Will Linger in the Sun, which has impacted many people, to composing, you know, the Macbeth stuff, which impacts people in a different way. How, how was the challenge of doing that? different to producing your own music and and i guess the the um uh not to use the word legacy again but the impact it's had because obviously Macbeth and, and that is a you know the broadway stuff but then you've impacted so many people with your own work so what how how did that challenge you in different ways working on the broadway stuff compared to writing your own music and creating your own stuff uh, in that way oh it was such a cool I am so grateful for that assignment because it was a very big learning mm. curve. I don't know if you knew this, but it was pre-recorded, so I actually did produce it. Like I recorded it, and then. But the hard part was, so so how it how it went down is I went in, into the studio three nights a week, just me and the recording engineer, um, and I would lay out all the violin tracks, and I had themes for each main character basically but the theme would change you know Macbeth's theme starts out um dark and brooding and ends up very distorted and um he's very sick by the end right like not well and so I I loved playing with those themes but then I would record all these different parts and I would get them to a point where they could stand alone but then I sent them off to three of my favorite artists that I work with pretty regularly in Minnesota and I said add drums and keys and guitar to these but keep it subtle and abstract where it's not very it doesn't I don't want it to sound like a band I want it to be atmospheric and so they did that and then I went back with the engineer and we mixed them but the hardest part came when I got there um I was getting 
like, we need 13 more seconds on this cue. And it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, so what I ended up doing is asking the band to go and record five minutes or three or three to five minutes of drones and every key that I recorded in. So I gave them a list of keys. And then I said, record a few different textures of each drone. And then what I did is I could layer them up in my own way because um, I had this palette to choose from. And I can layer up the drones and then I could place uh, the way the, li- the theater works because it's live is they say the, a cue begins when you say the word go. And the go is like right after the right before the word that the music's supposed to start on or the, yeah. the moment in the script. So they go and then the music starts. And so I was able to create all these go cues with these ambient pads underneath so it felt very live that was so fun i mean it was so i'm glad i thought of that because otherwise it would have been it was very hard to deconstruct we deconstructed a lot and reconstructed it to fit in a live play but now i get to release the soundtrack and i'm really excited about that too because i get to remix it for you know an album and i think that's going to be really fun and there is a couple singing songs actually and so one of them um, was sung by a cast member. One of them got cut, so it'll still be on the soundtrack, but it got cut in the play. Um, but one of them was at the very end of the play, and it's sung by a cast member. But I get to record it and put it on the album. So it was just such a great learning experience. And it was really interesting to be in a different world where the music was only there to support. It wasn't like a performance. In, yeah. I mean, it was there to amplify the emotions um and i love doing that i hope i get to do something like that again someday because it's really fun yeah it sounds like you you put you really kind of challenge yourself as an artist to do that because it sounds like it's 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 you, you obviously have your skill set and, and you you create this beautiful music anyway but to go into there and work with other people and, and in, in that way it sounds like a real challenge even for you with your level oh, of yeah. experience yeah yeah Interesting. Yeah, it, it, it was, and it was a short timeline. So, like, I got the first through in November, and then all the music had to be at least in rough edit. Like, every cue had to be at least roughly ready to go by March 3rd. And so it was, like, four months of, I mean, it was about an hour of music. So it was about four months of, like, working and reworking and adding all these parts. And then, and then when we were there, it changed a lot again. So, like... Um, yeah, so it was a steep learning curve. I remember the reason I recorded three nights a week. I was like, I can't get to New York and be sixty-four percent done with the play. Like I have to be hundred percent. Like I have to have everything. And so it was a lot of pressure, but I'm glad because I managed to do it. And and the band was excellent. Like the people that worked with me were great. And the recording engineer deserves a medal of honor because he put in so much time with me. I mean, I knew I was going to be putting in a lot of time, but he put um, in, I mean, almost as much as me. It was, I mean, he put in a ton, of, probably more than me. I mean, he just, I can't even believe he did that. It was a huge, huge undertaking. He did a really good job. So that was really fun. That, that, that's awesome. And it's, you know, great to see all the social media posts and, and you having a, a wonderful time with it. It's very, very well deserved um, just to see how well you're doing. And, and, I, and I, I just think that's fantastic. Um, I, I do want to ask you about your attitude to, uh, going back to your own stuff now and touring. Now, obviously, w- when you started touring before you co-founded Ramped, you know you were you were going out to venues and you were doing you know gigs and shows. How has your attitude to touring changed as you've become more and more involved in uh, accessibility? Uh, I'm not going to say activism, that's the wrong word, but, you know, supporting, or is it the wrong word, but, you you know, you're supporting accessibility, promoting accessibility in venues. How has your attitude to touring and going around venues changed over the years since you've become more heavily involved in accessibility? That is my original question, which I went a very long way around asking that. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. Um, no, I guess, um, really, Realistically, Ramped kind of came at the right time where um, I had already in 2018 decided I was only going to play at accessible venues. And so that was a decision that I made about two years into touring because I realized venues weren't changing if I was willing to be lifted onto the stage or if I was willing 
to go across the street to use the bathroom instead of having one there. Like the more, if I went along with it, they weren't going to make the changes. So eventually yeah. it, it became something I just decided to, to put like a line in the sand. Partly so that other artists can feel empowered to do that. And partly so that I can help make change for other artists coming up. Um, but when Ramped came about, you know, Lachi and I had been on, Lachi's the founder, and we had been on maybe um, four or five panels together about diversity and disability culture, and we're like, it's great that people are talking about it, but the, the real things are the actions that need to happen after the conversations, and so that's why we founded it. So now what I like about Ramped, what has changed, I guess, in terms of advocacy is that now I don't just have to say I want accessible venues i can say look there's this coalition of 65 professional disabled artists that are also so it, it kind of lends like weight and support to things that i was doing and i think a lot of artists are doing on the sides and maybe aren't it's just not talked about very much but they're all having disabled artists often have to navigate behind the scenes and and but then you think of them as singular cases instead of like this is a part of our culture that we need to just make the changes so that it is inclusive and equitable for everybody. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's been really neat. And I think um, hoping in the future, the thing, other things that I want to do now, you know, like the farther I get in my career, I would love to have ASL interpretation at most of my shows. Um, or I mean, at all of them, ideally, but like sometimes in a small venue, I'm not necessarily playing at a place where, I can always afford to do that, but I'm yeah. really, really trying to figure out ways to make that the grant, the grant situation in the U S is not as good uh, as the UK where you for yeah. uh, grants like that. And so it's a, it's a creative endeavor to try to figure out. And another thing I want to do more of, which I had started to do before ramps, but I'm committed to is, you know, playing with other disabled artists and, and, and just passing along opportunities to other disabled artists because I think now that I know them, you know, before yeah. it's like I felt like a stranger in a strange land. And now I know that there's a lot of us and I can be like, or, or, you know, if somebody wants me for a panel and I'm not available, now I know to say, now I have a group of people I can be like, but I, I can't, but look at this other wonderful group of artists that's available for you. Yeah. So that's been really cool. The changes that way have been awesome. Yeah, no, that, that that is awesome to hear. And we are, in the UK, we're sort of steadily, there are bands and artists that are doing the same thing, you know, only playing accessible venues and things like that. If you could come up with, and I'm sure you get this a lot, if you had three key tips for venues in the UK uh, and the US globally, I suppose, three things or, or, or as many as you wish to put in. If a venue uh, owner, promoter is listening to this or sorry reads this um you know what kind of message do you want to give to them what do they need to be considering is it as simple as you know uh, we, we need you know a ramp drop curb things like that what kind of things could a venue do without because uh, a lot of things a lot of the times people tend to sort of say to me well we can't afford this or or you know we, we'd love to but this and that's the excuse and um so what would be your message to anybody that who is running a venue and wants to be accessible but is worried about some of those things yeah that's a great question um i would say that instead of using costs as a barrier as the first line of defense, yeah. which I agree is often the case. Mm. Um, I think it's important to start thinking in five year plans and, and thinking about creative fundraising, honestly, like if there are venue accommodations that you want to make, but don't have in your budget for this year, what kind of fundraising concert series can you have to raise the money to pay for those things? Because I think we can start thinking outside the box a little more creatively about the import it's so it's as important to me as if you pay your taxes right like you should just be financing that into your job and if if a venue can't ever afford then their five-year plan should be looking for a new building to do business from that is accessible and so i know in a in a place where it's historical i understand there are some barriers but it's not it's not a good enough excuse like if you look at other like so i think what i would urge venue owners and 
promoters to do is to think about disability as a form of diversity. And if you couldn't do it for another form of diversity, like if it would be inappropriate, then it's definitely is inappropriate to like leave out disability. And so anytime that you're talking about being an inclusive space or a welcoming space, it has to include disability because we are just a different form of diversity. Um, so yeah, fundraising differently is good. And then a couple of free things people can do is like alt text on their social media posts and like, and just highlighting disabled artists, like looking for them, trying to book them, you know, make it and, and not have it necessarily be a disability day, have it just yeah. be part of the regular lineup. You know, it doesn't always have to be tied to that because the more you normalize seeing disabled artists, um, the better it will go. Um, what I've heard, which I thought was great, that came out of Attitude is Everything. You love, love those talk guys. About, you know, yeah. yeah, I love those. I love them too. Uh, I met them at my very first gig in London. So they were like way back October, no, December 2016. I got to meet them. Um, and they they have an access rider, which, which should be for every artist, not just disabled artists, because not every disability is visible. So like, if there's an artist with a chronic illness who can't stand for an hour while they do their set, they might want a chair, but it's nicer to be able to um, just say that as a matter of course rather than to having to bring it up. Because a lot of people are afraid to request stuff for themselves that they need. Mm-hmm. I've gotten over that because of I just want to make it. I want it to speed up. So I'm like, let's start requesting this stuff now so that the next generation doesn't have to do all this stuff. That's you know, awesome. But I understand the hesitation and so access riders for everybody just kind of normalizes needing access and as you age what you know if you're playing till you're 85 you're probably going to start needing some of those access accommodations anyway so um yeah i guess those would be the main things is like you know just not using cost barrier as an excuse i don't think it's a good enough excuse in 2022 you know yeah. to make that um, it's, and, and, and you know what, if you have to build it in, like, this is what I think I'm going to start, you know, COVID has really changed a lot. We can talk about that for a second at some point, but like, um, when, when I'm comfortable touring again and I, at the second I get a chance to play venues that are big enough to just like set a ticket price, I'm going to build things like interpreters into the ticket price. Because yes. I mean, if an artist understands why the ticket's $5 more expensive, but but it's very clearly like this is an extremely accessible show and we have ASL and captioning or whatever you have. I do believe that people, if they understand that you're making it more inclusive, um, we'll, we'll just take that. You know, like I think Low did something where they started paying their opening bands more than the usual. And that's really cool. They, then they probably had to build it into their ticket price, but it was important to them. And I think, I want to see non-disabled artists start to do some of this stuff because I can do it. And of course, other disabled artists are doing it, but it's really going to take off when anyone, you yeah. know, anyone does it. So like, you know, what if like PJ Harvey has ASL at all our shows and then only plays at accessible venues, that would have a huge impact on the music industry. Yeah, it's a very interesting point, Galen, and thank you so much for for bringing that up as well. Uh, it's great to get plugs in for Attitude is Everything as well. Um, a few more questions then, four or five. I, I want to ask you about uh, your kind of time, because again, on social media, you can see, you know, you're everywhere, you're doing a lot of things. How do you manage your time between recording? <laughs> I, you see, I, I hear the laugh there. Um, uh, do you, how do you kind of how have you learned to incorporate self-care into tour well uh, playing performing recording you know the Macbeth stuff recording your own stuff Uh, talk to me about a typical day there probably isn't one and and how you've kind of learned to manage your time if that sounds does that sound like like does that sound okay might take because obviously time management means different things to different people but it sounds like you've got a lot on all the time so how do you incorporate your self-care and looking after yourself into that because it sounds like an intense schedule yeah uh well the previous like pre-covid i would say I didn't do a lot of balancing. Um, I loved what I was doing and touring was really fun, but we were, we were doing like a couple hundred shows a year and we were all over the place. And so my husband and I were not home very much. Um, And so 
and then I would record in these little pockets when we were back home, and and that was not sustainable for a long term, probably. Yeah. Um. So then when COVID hit, I decided to. I created a concert series that went every week for like 90 weeks, and now it's a monthly um, thing online. Yeah. Um, but it was cool. Um, noticing now, and that kept me like grounded and like, you know, I had other gigs as well that were all virtual, but I had something to do every week, right? Like I had a, a plan. And I've noticed actually, it's funny that you asked this question now. Um, Macbeth was great because that was super structured and I had a deadline and I'm good with deadlines and that was like okay I gotta get this done by this day and blah 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 and that that was fun for me now I'm realizing self-care in terms of like physical care like (laughs) like exercising and not having too many beers and (laughs) eating better and that kind of thing like those are all things that I have to focus on now that we're home because I feel I think I'm realizing something about myself is that I work under structured deadlines and structured situations. So now that things have kind of slowed down for me because I'm trying to work on a memoir and as yourself, you have to motivate yourself. I'm realizing I'm trying, I'm actually like literally this week trying to think of like, how do I set up time management to like touch my violin work on new music um but then also write and then not be working 24 hours a day like not spend 10 hours on email or something so um i think the the thing that i'm realizing is i have to create um accountability for myself does that make sense yeah it does like i actually yeah like i actually have a writing coach because i'm working on a memoir kind of about a tiny desk through now I guess or whatever whenever it's done um but the writing coach we just set up like a little spreadsheet where I like enter in how many words I wrote and what time I wrote because I'm like I need something besides myself to like follow through and on tour that was super easy but I have um figured like in the last maybe four or five months I felt kind of adrift and I think that's why is I need some kind of like schedule or accountability and so I'm working on that so because that brings me to my other point is I'm high risk for COVID Mm. but not only that I just I really believe in inclusiveness and for people who are high risk or immunocompromised going into a venue show where no one's wearing a mask is not a safe option and so I'm not really doing a lot of shows right now um indoors definitely not it's masked like everybody's wearing a mask yeah and then i'm i'm doing outdoor shows whenever i can but um but i'm starting to think about how do you recreate your life in a way that is equitable for everyone so like interesting in, yeah. as a musician so i'm i'm hoping that i mean i'm hoping eventually we have a vaccine where we can just all forget about covid that would be great but <laughs> yeah. um, I think that'll happen eventually but like until that happens I want to do, like, next year, for example, like, an outdoor tour where every show is outside because I just want it to be, I feel like we've done, you know, we're talking about accessibility in a lot of ways, but I think we can't forget that there are people who still aren't being included because they aren't feeling safe because of the way that we've handled COVID, and that's sad to me, but I think... I can be part of the creative solution to that, which will be, you know, I haven't toured yet because it just felt so unpredictable. But now that I see the lay of the land, which is probably nobody will wear masks unless you request it. And even if you request it, that might not happen. So outdoors just really does feel like the safest thing. So I'm trying to think of my new life touring when I go back in as maybe more seasonal or like in America, you could do the winter down south and the summers up north and just kind of reinventing that, which, you know, the onus, it's too bad that the onus always falls to the marginalized people to like figure out how to make it work. However, that being said, I'm kind of excited. I feel excited about touring again for the first time in a long time because I realized I don't have to accept the status quo. Like I never did. No. But I think a lot of artists, I mean, a lot of artists I've talked to are like, yeah, well, I got to start playing gigs again. And they're not that happy about the potential of getting sick on tour, but no. they're just, 
it's just the accepted it's accepted that that's just what you have to do and I pose an alternative option just because I think we shouldn't I I don't want to as a disabled performer leave people out of experiencing my music and and just the community that comes with music I, I just played at a festival low played at it as well called water and his life in Duluth and um and it was beautiful because it was all outside. And so people, even if they were high risk, they could wear a mask if they wanted to. They didn't, you know, but it was not, it was cool to see people who probably aren't doing indoor things be able to attend such a beautiful day. Yeah. And that's, I think a lot of artists could be aiming to create those experiences right now. So I want to focus on that in 2023, like next summer and then beyond. Um, what can I do? to change the paradigm a little bit around, you know, if COVID's not going away, which it looks like it probably isn't for a while, mm. um, how do we adjust in a way that feels um, not gross? To me, yeah. You know, that's yeah. what I'm working on. <laughs> yeah, no, you said... Yeah, no. I don't know, and not, yeah. No. Oh yeah, you go first. What? No, it's interesting. I was just saying, like the 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 vessel you played. I looked at the photos. It did look beautiful. But yeah, it would be nice to think. You know, it would be nice to think that people would, you know, be able to do more of that because, like you say, it doesn't look like COVID is is disappearing magically anytime soon. So it sounds like you're really working to 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 you know um, to find find. Um, alternatives you know alternative ways for people to enjoy live music and and it sounds like more people might get behind you over time as well hopefully yeah i mean i'm doing an event on wednesday an indoor event but i'm <laughs> it's unmasked so i was like well i'll play but i'm gonna wear a mask so i'm not gonna sing i'm just gonna do instrumentals and they were okay with that i mean the thing is partly you know what what being a disabled artist has taught me is pretty much you're you do have to advocate for yourself Absolutely. like at this point it's not it's not built in yet and so i'm not afraid necessarily and and, and i said it's okay with me if that's not a good solution but this is what this is what i'm comfortable with that work for you and they said yes and that and so um i think it's okay to ask and the more people that are willing to say well, what really feels safe or what feels equitable and just ask for it, and the worst that they can say is no, right? And so, um, I don't know. So I, I, I want to keep asking for creative solutions from artists about COVID, and then just about accessibility in general. Like, how do you make things more accessible? Because at the end of the day, um, our society benefits from just being more diverse, you know, and having more more different kinds of bodies out there. I mean, if you're not disabled, you still probably know and love someone who is. So it affects, I think it impacts everybody. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Very, very good point, Galen. And, and a few more questions before we finish. Um, uh, one of the things, I want, before we get some messages for your fans and things like that, one of the things that I do want to ask you, I know people ask you about your musicianship a lot, but one of the things that really strikes me um, is, is just, that I remember the first time I listened to your voice and I remember having a conversation with Martin Atkins about this as well and like how the hairs on the back of my neck stood up listening to you sing and I wanted to get you to take me back to an early moment in your life where you kind of found your voice if you could if you can remember if you could take me back to a moment or a series of moments where you where you found this kind of uh, uh I don't want to sound too weird but this beautiful instrument because obviously you're very skilled um you know in multiple instruments but but your voice is is just it's a beautiful thing so could you take me through where you found your Thanks. voice and how that has again how your relationship with your voice and how you feel about it has changed over the years yeah, that's a great question. Um, so my first experience, my very first experience of singing was in theater, but it wasn't that I, it wasn't the same. It just isn't the same, I guess. Um, it wasn't a part of my consciousness of like, oh, I want to be a singer. I was just in plays and sang sometimes. But then, um, in 2006, I moved back to Duluth um, to finish up college. And I started, I joined like a a folk duo called Gable and Galen and um he played guitar and band I played violin and and sang backup harmonies and one time he's like you really got to pick 
at least one song. It's the thing we done, right? Because I love harmonizing. That is one thing I miss when I'm not in a band is I really like doing harmonies. But um, but when I'm singing, you know, solo, that's obviously not what I'm doing. So she was like, you got to pick one song. So I picked Little Boxes by Malvina Reynolds. And that was my song. And I did that for a while. And I was so terrified. I mean, it's I played violin for a long time since I was 10. And I, I, you know, I can still get nervous, but it's just not the same. Like something about singing is like incredibly more vulnerable. Um, mm-hmm. So it was hard. But I did it and I loved it. And it kind of gradually kind of kicks in. And I still did harmonies, blah, blah, blah. But then... Um, I met Alan Sparhawk in Duluth and um, he had this project. He was doing a live film score and asked if I could do violin and he live looped my violin while I just played harmonies. Cause again, harmonizing um, I played harmonies on my violin to what I was hearing. Um, this is before I learned how to loop myself. Um, and and then we practiced a whole lot for that show because it was a full length film. And he's like, why don't we just, you know, book some shows? And so we, we learned some cover songs. We learned a couple of his songs. And then about two days before the show, I randomly wrote my first song. Like it was like, it just popped out of my brain. Um, I was on the way to work and I was like, what's, and so I went to the, I said I was going to the bathroom, but I just went out in the hall and wrote down the lyrics so I wouldn't forget it. And I, show it Alan at our next band practice and he's like that's good we should do it tomorrow and I was like you know and so I wrote one more he said you need one more verse so I, like, okay. so I added a verse and then um we did it the next day and I remember introducing it like this might suck it's my first song he made me stop and reintroduce it because <laughs> he's like you can't say it. it's gonna suck this is like all happening on stage there's actually a video of it and it makes me laugh so because it was very nerve-wracking and that was scary and I remember just being terrified basically and then the more you do it like and then I would write a man for songs after that and that's kind of when I started performing um you know my own stuff or whatever and uh I guess what, what becomes evident is the more you sing, the better your voice becomes. Like, the more control you have over it, the more refined. I'm not saying that my voice has changed dramatically, but I notice that it's different. Like, if I listen to earlier recordings, I can sing those first recordings better now than I could end because I've just done it so much more. And so it's it's like anything, I think, practicing, but you don't think of it. You don't think of singing. For me, I never thought of singing as something that you had to practice. But the more I toured, the more I learned about how to control it. And so, I don't know. I love singing now. I mean, I I love to play, and I really like improvising and looping, which I'm so grateful Alan introduced me to. Is like a huge part of my musical journey. But um, singing has a different quality of like, you know, it's just a different energy exchange. But I really really got hooked on and yeah it's really fun i don't know but it it is scary to like start something new like that or it was for me it felt very out of my element at the beginning Mm. and now it's just super fun absolutely absolutely no it's, it's it's thank you for taking me through that as well it's again it's interesting to hear about your process um uh, a couple more then before we finish up um i wanted to ask you about your uh the things that inspire you the most outside of music now i know that you have again you have the activism side of things you've made a lot of friends across the world uh, through music mm-hmm. and through your work um so what are the kind of you mentioned your husband who is of course tours, tours with you as well what are the things that motivate you and keep you passionate um uh, you know, outside of music at the moment, things that really drive you uh, outside of the musical sphere? Um, I had started watercolor painting oh, um, oh, over the pandemic. Yeah, I think I saw a poem yeah. on Facebook. Yeah, lovely. Yeah, and, and I really, I think what what I'm, what I'm realizing is that, like, just things that are creative, um you know, watching other people do them or doing them yourselves, trying something new. I I love painting because it's not actually tied to, you know, like anything I do for a living. It's just for fun. And so it's kind of nice to like explore this thing that doesn't have to be anything and you can just create because it's fun. And I share them because it's, I'm like, sweet, I made a thing, but they're not always even good. Like it's fun to just kind of have, um, 
this other hobby on the side. Um, things that inspire me, you know, I think spirituality is a huge part of who I am and I don't subscribe to a particular religion, I guess. I mean, probably most close way to Quakerism, like okay. the Quaker faith, but, um, but I haven't gone in a long time. Um, but the idea, especially through COVID and just beyond like what's happening now, I think the idea of learning how to forgive and love each other, although not easy and I'm not that good at it always, um, is something that inspires me, though, because I just can't think of any other reason that we're here. You know, like, it just it doesn't make, like, that, I think, makes the most sense. It's not about even what you do necessarily. It's how you walk away from something or, like, what how you interact with it, you know? Um and it's a bar that never, it's like the violin. You could play the violin for seven decades and you could always get better. And I think it's the same thing with how you love and forgive um, yourself and other people. Like, um, just kind of realizing the interconnectedness um, is inspiring to me because it's it's so practical. You know, it's like your marriage, your friendships, your business relationships, your emails, all of it um, can be looked at through that lens and if you remember um and then nature i guess like i love lake superior i'm very inspired by the water of the great lakes i don't know why i love them so much but i really do like go sit down by the lake pretty much every day um and just being around nature and you know witnessing the just the intricate things and being home more since covid because we were gone a lot for like four full years when we got home like noticing little changes of the season has been very delightful. You know, we garden too. So like um, in our apartment, we have a couple of garden boxes and like just seeing ways the seasons change um, just is a fun, inspiring thing. So yeah, those things I'll, I'll do. And then uh, other people's music, I really like listening to like Celtic music and jazz. And um, I love seeing artists that I admire performing i mean like you know it's just it's just i don't know, watching other people do creative things is also really a fun source of inspiration because kind of reminds you why you're doing it you know what i mean yeah a hundred percent yeah we, i i get a lot of that from from you so it's lovely to be able to to sit down with you oh. after after so long um before the the press and plugging question which we'll do at the end um what i wanted to squeeze in one more uh, more personal question yeah. uh, i i spoke to a fan of yours uh, the other week um here in the uk and they're a musician as well i work with a lot of people with uh, cerebral palsy i have cerebral palsy myself uh, and um they uh, get on stage uh, with great difficulty sometimes uh, and they're very worried about what people are thinking and how people look at them and things like that and i wanted to ask you because i don't want to assume and i don't want to make any assumptions have you ever felt like that and how did you overcome it you know that worry that people are you know thinking things and and maybe maybe making assumptions about what you're capable of and things like that because this is this person's you know worries and fears when they get on stage so uh, they, you know uh, kind of got me thinking have you ever felt like that and how did you overcome that and at what point in your career did you um not stop giving a, a, an f that's not what i'm going for but you know what i mean <laughs> when, when did yeah. you when, when did that when did that kind of did that happen for you and how did you overcome it yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think the probably, I mean, by the time I was in junior high, I pretty much, because there's a surgery I could have had, a bunch of surgeries, mm. where they could have straightened out my arms and my legs one at a time every summer. And then maybe I could have walked. Maybe not. They were, you know, it was very, you know, what the outcome would be. And, uh, and I tossed that around for a long time. Um, but then by the time I was in junior high, I was like, A, I like playing violin. I don't want to mess up the nerves in my hand. But also, my wheelchairs are getting better. I have, I, I was interested, I just am interested in a lot of things. And so I just didn't feel like walking was going to really enhance the way I lived. And so by then, I just, and, and I also felt, and maybe, I don't know if you've ever felt this way, but like, I don't think I'd be me without my disability so at some point I just felt like I was supposed to be this way mm. whether or not that's true like I mean you we don't all have the same spiritual beliefs or whatever but like I just kind of feel like 
and not for like a great edification of humanity, but just because who I am, I just feel like this is, I don't feel out of place in my body. Um, and so I kind of let that, that stuff go. People still say weird things sometimes, mm. little, little kids will cry once in a while and like just interactions that are like, Oh crap, forgot. Like, but, yeah. but like ultimately I, I decide repeatedly that it just doesn't, A, I can't do anything about it. B, it doesn't really matter what other people think. And then, like, C, I, you got to give people space to change their misconceptions. You know, I know that when I play a show, there are most people there, I would say, the vast majority are there because they like the music and they connect with it. And on some level, if they give me a compliment after the show, it's because they genuinely liked something that they heard, right? Um, but there's always, once in a while, a person that comes up and is like, oh, this is so inspiring to see you. But, but I have to give them grace to either, like, maybe they meant it in a way that I can't quite understand and that's fine. Or they might still change their mind. Like if they go buy a CD and then they listen to it, eventually maybe the disability won't be the reason that they're listening to it. You know what I mean? Like, I just think giving people a space to, um, get over their misconceptions is usually, it's just a happier way to live. Like, Like I could be mad. And sometimes I'm like advocacy. I still have to step back sometimes. Like, Like, with COVID stuff, I don't, I mean, I know everybody's got their own stuff on that, but, like, I feel very strongly that way too many people with disabilities died of COVID. And so there are certain parts in this journey where I've had to stop, just stop reading about it, stop talking about it, stop thinking about it, because I don't want to let that dim my inner happiness. Mm. Um, So with disability, you know, your friend or anyone, myself, I just don't let myself think about it too much. Of course, if you do think about everything that's wrong with disability, uh, and not the disability itself, but the society in which you live, you will be pissed, right? Like, you yeah. will be. Yeah. Um, and so it's not worth your thoughts, basically. And, so, um, and most people, I would say, if you don't care about what they think about your body or whatever, the vast majority of people I have encountered have genuinely been like just cool music fans. Like they yeah. like music and they like your music. And so those are the people that I'm playing for. And if there happens to be a few people who are really judgmental in the audience, that's their loss ultimately for not understanding, you know? Absolutely. Um, yeah. I don't know. And, and my kids, I love because I play at a lot of schools when I get a chance because kids are so open-minded and adaptable. So when I perform, I mention that I adapt the way I play. I play up and down like a cello. I, t- I tell them that. And then a music teacher helped me figure that out so that they know why I play differently. But that's the only thing I say about disability. And you read their little letters because a lot of times the teachers make them oh. write thank you notes. And, uh, and their little letters, I mean, they get so much out of that. They're like, I don't have to be afraid to try my thing and I didn't say that to them. you know what I mean like they yeah. just came out stuff and I just think kids, kids are there for the right reasons so if anything performing your friend like or anyone with a disability like it's not about inspiring people but it's about normalizing stuff and so like the it. more that you do what you do you normalize it and then all of a sudden the next generation isn't having to go through these insecurity feelings that we are yeah because it's normal it's just typical you know absolutely now that 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 makes so much sense to me and it's lovely to hear it in in your own words and uh i could talk to you for hours and hopefully we'll get to do this again soon Gaylin. but uh, i'm gonna leave the floor to you to finish off with uh messages for fans anything coming up you've got your memoir i don't want to put words in your mouth is there anything you feel like we've missed that you want to plug uh before we finish up Oh man, um, I no, I just I think it's a uh, check out ramps dot org uh, because and and attitude is everything. I mean, both of those places. There's so many great artists. Ruth Lyons, one of my favoriteest, favoriteest uh, d- disabled UK artists. Uh, she's amazing. Have you heard of Ruth Lyon? Yeah, I've heard of them. Yeah, L Y O N. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, and Holy Moly and the Crackers. I think it's yeah. their, like full band. Great. Yep. So they're awesome and um. But 
in terms of like where what I'm at is besides the memoir, which probably won't be out for a little while, you can support the memoir and like get a monthly writing sample um, on my Patreon. So I've been sending my Patreon team like a little sample of what I've been working on um, about once a month. And then for the writing, and then I recorded, I got to record the vocal harmonies on a Michael Stipe track that's not yet, a net, like, I don't know when it's coming out, but it was so fun uh, just to, like, record with somebody who knows so much about recording. I mean, it was just ridiculous. It was, so that will be coming out sometime, I think, in the next year. Um, and then the best soundtrack I'm hoping to release in 2023. I'm not sure exactly when, but that's going to be fun because each track title is going to be the the go word, the way, like where it goes in the play. So you could read the scripts and follow along and press play just for fun if you wanted to do that to make that. So, um, and just the fans, like I, I miss the UK. I really want to get back there. I know it'll happen eventually. Um, not sure exactly when, but, um, you know, I'm still planning to resume touring at some point, but, but just keep thinking about creative ways to be inclusive and to raise the money that you need and, Creativity, I think, is going to be key. And I think that's the disabled. If I had a legacy or if disability culture has a legacy, I think what our legacy is going to be is creativity. You know, like like the world wasn't built for us, so how are we going to redesign it? And nobody's asking us to do it. It's just that we, we are doing it by default. And instead of being angry, for me, what's helped, especially this year, instead of being angry at, at how inaccessible the world is or how little disability was taken into consideration during COVID or whatever, all this stuff. Um, I'm trying to remember that nonetheless, if we're creative and we create positive change, that's such a, it's almost like it's like an honor or like a, it's a place to be that could be worse, right? Like if you're making the world better for other people, they don't even have to know it. Like a lot of, you know, a lot of the good that happens in the world, people don't know why it happens or, where it came from but you get to be part of that positive creative change and and hopefully making it mainstream and eventually you know like it's like with curb cuts those sidewalk cutaways Mm. i don't think anyone knows the person who pushed for those like i don't i can't tell you who somebody probably spent their whole life working to make the streets more accessible and now they are and we can all benefit from it and i think we can create that kind of legacy even if we don't get recognized for it um and it doesn't mean that that makes everything okay or right yeah but it, it helps for my own mental health to like try to remember that it doesn't if the outcomes don't have to be the outcomes are positive even if you don't see the see the immediate aftermath of it you know what i mean interesting yeah honestly that that like that's helped me a lot as well because I often think about stuff like that. So thank you uh, so much for making the time for me, Gail, and I really appreciate it. Like awesome. honest, honestly, like it's so cool to sit with you anyway, uh, but but just to, to be able to pick your brains about stuff like that's that's just awesome. So thank you so much.